the, uh, the winds came and blew upon or beat upon the house and it fell not for it was founded upon a rock. So if you'll stand with me and turn to page 125, we're going to sing the solid rock. We'll sing the first, the second, and the fourth verse. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest ring, but only lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the Son. chapter number 12 and if you know uh, anything about where we are in the book of Kings as far as first Kings chapter number 12 you know that thus far uh, the Bible's dealt with Solomon um, and some of his reign and again who he was and who the Lord allowed him to become uh, we know Solomon and many of the books uh, that he was uh, a part of writing uh, to be ones of great wisdom and so uh, we know of course what the Lord did in his life by bringing him that wisdom uh, and so after all of that, you, you'd think that he'd have a great start, and we've talked about this before, and so I'm just kind of 
uh, bringing it back to your mind and jogging your memory, you'd think he'd be uh, again on fire for the Lord because all the Lord had done for him. But at the end of Solomon's life, there's uh, some issues. And what happens is he brings in all these different ladies and has all these different wives. And what that does is brings in a whole host of uh, false gods and idols now that Solomon is worshiping. And because he's worshiping them, now the children of Israel are being misled and some of those different things. And so uh, the end of Solomon is not quite as prosperous as the beginning. Uh, but what tonight we're going to look at is after Solomon's gone, what did he leave behind? And then who took over uh, when Solomon was gone? And, and was there any translation of some of those problems there uh, because of Solomon and some of his life? And so we're going to read starting in verse number one of chapter number 12. And we're going to pray in just a minute. The Bible says this. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make uh, him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon. And Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. It says this, that they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and, and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, Thy father made our yoke grievous. Now therefore make the, uh, uh, thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us, lighter, and we will serve thee. And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And, the, and King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived, and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servant forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put on us lighter? And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, That thou shalt speak unto this people that spake unto, you, uh, uh, spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shall say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lade you uh, with, heavy, uh, with a heavy yoke, I will uh, add to your yoke. My father has chastised you with wits, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So let's pray. We'll jump into uh, what all is going on there in that chapter. Lord, again, love you so much. We need you here with us tonight. And God, we pray that you'd be here. We pray that you're working in the hearts of each and every believer. And God, we pray that you're moving us along in our journey of life, ultimately giving glory to you each and every day of our life. And Lord, that is the, the story of our life. Uh, we want to bring souls with us, but we want to present to you, God, lives that have been uh, used and lived again, gathering glory for you that we can present to you. And so, God, I pray that you are moving. I pray that you're working. I pray, God, that you'd stir this church up tonight. And God, I pray by your words that you convict our hearts. So we love you. Invite you to be part of the service, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So what we have here, uh, again, is what we detailed moments ago. Now Solomon's gone, and this uh, Rehoboam is going to serve in his stead. Now Rehoboam is Solomon's son, and so he's the next in line, again, to take this throne and to reign over these people. So he's presented with, at the beginning of his ministry, kind of a unique situation. The people come and they say, well, uh, you know, Solomon was really hard on us. <laughs> he asked us to do a whole lot and, uh, you know, he had a whole bunch of uh, things that we had to do and different things. When you're king, can you uh, maybe lift some of these things, right, and make them lighter that we could, uh, again, have just maybe a little bit more rest and not be so worked and uh, so immediately faced with this decision that he's got to make on how he's going to rule. And I feel like in life, a lot of times when uh, maybe somebody who's new to a role steps in, uh, right, they have some choices to make about who they're going to be and how they're going to do and, and some of those different things. Uh, and I don't know about you, but sometimes that new position or power or whatever it is uh, can be wielded in the wrong way, right? Sometimes in the right way, praise the Lord, and that's how it ought to be, but sometimes in uh, the wrong way. Uh, I heard somebody say this, and, and don't be offended by this, if, if you're uh, somebody who uh, disagrees with me, that's okay, but I always heard from my stepdad, he's a police officer, that as he was around the, the different police officers, and even as he did training and he taught courses and some of those different things, he said the worst police to be pulled over by were the female state troopers. Now listen, and here's what he said, because they feel like they have something to prove 
because of the authority they've been given. And traditionally, it was a man's job before that. He said they are the worst because they got a chip on their shoulder that they have to demonstrate. Now, now that's not uh, a feminist remark and some of those different things. But, but again, he said, man, they got something to prove. And so here's now Rehoboam in his father's stead. First decision now he's been presented with. First thing he's got to deal with. It's very important how he handles this thing again and proceeds further. And so the, the request is make these burdens lighter on us. His response is, well, I need time to think. And that's not bad. That's not wrong to have time to think about what you're going to say. He says, so do this in verse number five. Depart for three days, then come again to me and the people departed. And here's what he does. He does something that's very wise. He goes and he seeks counsel of other people. Now, I want you to notice the two different councils that he addresses and their response to him on how he ought to address these people, uh, again, in response to the thing that they've asked of him to make their burdens lighter. It says this in verse number six. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon, his father, while he yet lived and said, how do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and will serve them, answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. They say, speak good things, speak kind things, speak things that they're going to want to hear, uh, again, to kind of bring them along in this journey, rather than killing them, right, with words, uh, and beating them down and making this yoke heavier. Lift these people up, right? Lift them up and, and help them walk along in this journey, which is good advice, amen, to, to not kill people, but rather to lift them up and, and help them through this journey of life. I feel sometime, so many times you and I uh, can do the opposite, amen, with our words, with what we do, and we can be so harsh that we're not lifting people up, but rather tearing them down or what have you. And uh, they say the opposite. They say, well, go to them with kind words, with good words, lift them up and bring them through this thing. And then he goes to these other uh, uh, people, this other council, right? This is the second council. And they give him the, the complete opposite advice in verse number eight. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men that were grown up with him, which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people who have spoken unto me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put on us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him that spake unto him, saying, Thus shall speak unto the people uh, that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but thou make it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. Here's what they said. Uh, you've got to man up, buddy, because now you're presented with the situation. You've got to be tougher than your father ever was. They think they're going to catch a break with you. You need to put the hammer right to the nail and you need to put the pedal to the metal and, and show these guys who's boss. They said, so tell them your, your pinky finger is going to be bigger or wider than your father's loins. You're going to be the man. Here, here's what they say in, in verse number uh, nine. It says this. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. In verse number 10, it says this. But, but uh, my little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke. I will add to your yoke, my father, uh, 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 I'm sorry, my father, I chastise you with whips, but I will chastise you with what? Scorpions. He's, he said, I'm going to do it even worse than my father chastised you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go even harder. You thought his yoke was heavy. You thought his burdens were something to carry. Wait till you find mine. Watch this in verse number 12. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, come unto me again the third day. Now he's going to give his response to these people now he's heard counsel from both sides and the king answered the people what's the bible say yeah. roughly he answered them roughly he didn't handle it with delicacy he didn't handle it with care or with love or with any of these different things like it ought to be done uh, again because people are just people amen and they need grace and they need love the bible says he answered them roughly he was just rough about it watch this and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. Watch this. Wherefore the king hearkened not unto the people, for the cause was from the Lord, that he might perform his saying, which the Lord spake unto Ahijah, uh, the Shilonite, unto Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. Now to get context of what's going on here, you'd have to go back in scripture to chapter number 11 and we won't go there but you can mark this down in your notes if you're somebody who takes notes you want to go back and read this later on tonight in chapter number 11 and verse number 26 going on down 
the Lord tells Jeroboam that he's going to reign, that he's going to remove the kingdom from the house of Solomon. Again, because of Solomon taking in all those different ladies and all the different false gods. Now, Rehoboam, his son, right, bringing in uh, uh, all kinds of, of different things. Now, we haven't seen that yet. We're going to see it here in a minute. But he dealt with God's people in a rough manner. He displeased them. And here in a little bit, we're going to see what happens because of his dealings with these uh, uh, people of Israel. It says this in, uh, in verse number uh, 3. Uh, I'm sorry. In, 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 yeah, verse number 3 of chapter 12 says this. Nope, we're in our wrong spot, aren't we? Where are we at? I lost my place. Uh, verse number 15. There we are, 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, so after he's answered them, told them what he's going to do, I'm going to be harder on you, they hearkened not unto them. The people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the sons of Jesse to your tents. O Israel, now see thine own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. But as for the children of Israel which dwelt in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. The king Rehoboam, I'm sorry, then king Rehoboam sent Adoram. Uh, who was over the tribute, and all Israel stoned him with stones, that he died. Therefore King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David unto this day, and it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none that followed the house of David but the tribe of Judah only. So now what's happened is Rehoboam's dealt with God's people in a a poor manner, he chose to answer them roughly. Now they've rejected him as their leader and they're gonna bring in this man, Jeroboam. So here's what you could say, just as a short summary of what's happened so far, Solomon's end was a rough end, right? He brought in all these different gods. Because of that, the Lord passed it on from Solomon now to Rehoboam. Rehoboam didn't handle the office correctly. So now the office has been passed from Rehoboam it seems like there's this trouble that's handed down, again, because of the sins that these men allow to be a part of their lives. It seems like it's visiting now the people that are after them. Watch this in verse number 21. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, 104 score thousand chosen men, uh, which were warriors to fight against the house of Israel to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the sons of Solomon. But the word of God came unto Shemaiah, the, uh, the man of God, saying, Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and unto all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the remnant of the people, saying, Thus saith the Lord, ye shall not go up, nor fight against your brethren, the children of Israel. Return every man to his house, for this thing is from me. They hearkened, therefore, to the word of the Lord, and returned to depart according to the word of the Lord. And so Rehoboam goes out and gets an army and says, Listen, if you guys aren't going to follow me and... Uh, you're not going to have me be king, then I'm going to force you. Uh, now, luckily, the Lord steps in and, and stops this thing from happening. But here's what we're going to see about this Jeroboam in verse number 25. So now, mind you, Jeroboam is the man in charge. Now, uh, then Jeroboam built Shechem and Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein and went out uh, thence and bit, uh, built Penuel. It says this, and Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the, king, uh, the kingdom return to the house of David, and this people shall go to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem. Then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, the king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, Is it too much for you to go up to Jerusalem? Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Here's what he does. He says, if I get these people worshiping again, if I lead them the right way, it's going to remind them of this Rehoboam. They're going to go back to his ways, and they're going to bring him back in and get rid of me, Jeroboam. So what does Jeroboam do? So now you've got two leaders that have already been a problem. You've got Solomon. Then you've got Rehoboam. Now you've got Jeroboam, who's going to be a problem. The Bible says that he brings in these two golden calves. Well, do you remember the first roundabout with the golden calves of the children of Israel when Moses is up on the mount talking to God? The Lord gives them the tablets of stone and Moses comes down and they're dancing around the calf that Aaron made them, right? The, the guy whose family was supposed to be the line of priests. They come down and they see them dancing around the golden calves. Moses is so fierce and mad, he, he breaks the tablets that God just wrote on, right? So they, they've already been prone to worshiping again these gods. And then notice what Jeroboam says. O Israel, these be thy gods that brought thee out of the land of Egypt. He refers to that same verbiage, again, that Aaron used back with the children of Israel dancing at the base of that mountain. 
And so what does Jeroboam do? He brings in these false gods now. By the way, doesn't that sound familiar to what Solomon did? Brought in these false gods. Now you've got three people in a row that have had this issue with not having their trust and their focus in the right place, but rather worrying about other things, specifically in Jeroboam's case, his power, his kingdom, his seed that he was scared the children would give away. He said, no, we're going to bring in these other gods. You can worship them. Forget about God and forget about the ways of David. Worship this new way. Watch this. It says in verse number 29. And he set the one in Bethel and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin for the people went to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not the sons of Levi, which again were the, was the direct commandment of the Lord that they would be the priests. And Jeroboam ordained a feast on the eighth month of the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar, so did he in Bethel, sacrificing unto the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places which he had made. So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel, the fifteenth day of the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart, and ordained a feast on the children of Israel. And he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So, so far, you've got three guys in a row that have just been off. Right? They, they, they've just been off mark, off target. They, they've not shot towards God. They've not been pursuing him at different points in their uh, ministry. Now Solomon gets back on track at the end of his life, but at the end of his ministry there, he was off. And so now these other men, because of the problems that have been brought into the children of Israel, now are dealing with these same things. And they can't blame it on the children. It's in their own hearts. Jeroboam, we see it's because of his power he doesn't want to lose. Now we've got this mess, essentially, you could sum it up as a mess, where the children of Israel don't know which way to turn. Now they're worshiping calves, and they're divided, and all kinds of different things. Now the Lord's going to have to clean this thing up. Look at chapter number 13, verse number 1. And behold, there came a man of God. Uh, by the way, that's what they needed all along. Amen? They needed a man of God. They didn't need these other kings who were going to worship all kinds of different things. They didn't need mighty, powerful men of value. Uh, uh, that's what the Bible says. If you go back to that chapter number 11 about Jeroboam, as he was a mighty man of valor, he, he was a, a big guy, mighty guy. They didn't need that. What they needed was a man after God's heart. They needed a man of God that would chase God and pursue him rather than the different things of the world. It says this, uh, the, the man of God went out, or I'm sorry, there came a man of God out of Judah, by the word of the Lord on the Bethel, and Jeroboam stood by the altar to burn incense. And he cried against the altar, this is the man of God, in the word of the Lord, and said, O altar, altar, thus saith the Lord, behold, a child shall be born in the house of David, Josiah by name, and upon thee shall he offer the priest the high places that burn incense upon thee, and men's bones shall be burnt upon thee. And he gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which the Lord hath spoken. Behold, the altar shall be rent, and the ashes that are upon it shall be poured out. It says this in verse number four. And it came to pass when King Jeroboam heard the saying of the man of God, which had cried out against the altar in Bethel, that he put forth his hand from the altar, saying, Laid hold on him. And his hand, which he put forth uh, against him, dried up so that he could not pull it again to him. He points his fingers at this guy and he says, Get him, right? That's what Jeroboam he says. Get this guy. He's prophesying against our false gods, against our altars. Get him. Somebody pulled him. In the moment he points out, the Bible says his hand was dried up so that he could not use his hand anymore. Watch this in verse number five. The altar also was rent and the ashes poured out from the altar according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of the Lord. And the king answered and said of the man of God, Entreat now the face of the Lord thy God and pray for me that my hand may be restored again. And the man of God besought the Lord and the king's uh, hand was restored him again. And became as it were before. And the king said of the man of God, come home with me and refresh thyself and I will give thee a reward. So what's happened so far is this king now, Jeroboam, who rejected God and worshipped these idols, has an experience with God and his power, with the man of God first that prophesies and said this thing's going to happen. Now the Lord right, intervenes, dries up his hand, and who does he recognize immediately? He says, pray to your God, seek him. Seek his face and, and, and pray that my hand would be restored to me, right? The, the moment that things went bad, he immediately recognized that God ought to be back in that place where God should be. So what happens? He goes to the man of God and says, pray. The man of God prays. His hand's restored. And now watch 
what's going to happen now that he realizes who God is. It says this in, in verse number 7, Come home with me, I'll give you a refreshment reward. The man of God, in verse number 8, said unto the king, If thou wilt give me half thine house, I will not go in with thee, neither will I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so it was charged me by the word of the Lord, saying, Eat no bread nor water, uh, nor turn again by the same way that thou camest. So he went another way and returned not by the way that he went to Bethel. He says, let me let me reward you. Let me bring you in and feed you and, and all these different things that I can reward you for your good deeds. He has this moment, right, of revelation that this is now the right way to walk, not the, not the calves and the other idols that we were worshiping. But the story picks up now with this man of God. So this is interesting to me. Because you naturally want to follow that story of Jeroboam, right, and, and follow that thing all the way through. But the Bible immediately cuts to now this man of God. So, so here's what we have so far. Again, this is so fascinating the way that this is laid down. You've got Solomon, jumps directly to Rehoboam, his son, jumps directly from Rehoboam to Jeroboam, and then from Jeroboam now to this man of God. And here's the problem. Each one of these men, all the way down, even the man of God, even Solomon, the, the man that was wiser than any man that's ever walked on earth, besides Jesus Christ himself, had issues, watch this, with disobeying what God had told them to do. God told this man of God not to go in unto any of these people, not to go in, not to eat, not to drink while he was in that place, but to walk a different way than the way he came, not to go back to the place he had been. We'll see it in verse number 11. Watch this. Now there dwelt an old prophet in Bethel, and his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. The words which he had spoken unto the king, them they had told also their father. And their father said unto them, What way went he? It says this, For his sons had seen what way the man had went, which came from uh, Judah. And he said unto his son, Saddle me the ass. So they saddled him the ass, and he rode thereon, and went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. And he said unto him, Art thou the man of God that came as from Judah? And he said, I am. Then he said unto him, Come home with me and eat bread. And he said, I may not return with thee, nor go in with thee. Neither will I eat nor drink water with thee in this place. For it was said to me by the word of the Lord, Thou shalt eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that thou camest. So there we see it, clear as day. He knows what he's been charged. He knows the duty he's been given. Not to go in with this man, not to drink, not to do anything, just to go a different way. And he said unto him in verse number 18, watch this, I am a prophet also as thou art. And an angel spake unto me by the word of the Lord, saying, Bring him back with thee into thine house, that he may eat, and, uh, eat bread and drink water. But he lied unto him. So he went back with him and did eat uh, bread in his house and drink water. So here's what we've got now, four men in a row that the Bible has depicted that all have this issue with disobedience and it's cost each and every one of them dearly as far as these things go solomon literally had to hand over the kingdom that he was king over rehoboam the same thing was true now he's a, a king of a much smaller group of people rather than the whole these 10 tribes are now given to jeroboam jeroboam messes up now he's not in the right standing with god he's worshiping idols and now this man of god who was used to deliver these children of Israel, again, from the false beliefs of these idols, is now in disobedience to God and is going to pay with his entire life because of what he's done. This problem of disobedience is so deep-rooted in these children of Israel. It's, 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 it's who they are as you look at a whole. Uh, what they're constantly struggling with is disobedience and worshiping these false idols. Watch what happens to this guy, and then we'll talk about it here in just a moment. It says this. It says uh, in verse number 20, it says, And it came to pass as they sat at the table that the word of the Lord came unto the prophet that brought him back. And he cried unto the man of God that came from Judah, saying, Thus saith the Lord, for as much as thou hast disobeyed the mouth of the Lord, and hast not kept the commandments which the Lord thy God commanded thee, but camest uh, back and hast eaten bread and drunk water in the place of, uh, uh, which the Lord did say to thee, Eat no bread and drink uh, no water. Thy carcass shall not come unto the sepulcher of thy father's. And it came to pass after he had eaten bread and after he had drunk that he saddled for him the, the ass to wit for the prophet whom uh, uh, he had brought back. It says this, and when he was gone, a lion met him by the way and slew him and his carcass was cast in the way and the ass stood by and the, uh, the lion also stood by the carcass. And behold, the men passed by and saw the carcass cast in the way, the lion standing by the carcass and they came and told it in the city where the old prophet dwelt. And when the prophet that brought him back from the way heard thereof, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient 
unto the Lord. This old prophet knew. Uh, he knew what the Lord had told him to do. He knew that he was being disobedient, right? And so now he's pointing out, he, he knows exactly who it is. It's that disobedient prophet that didn't listen. Therefore the Lord hath delivered him unto the lion, which had, had torn him and slain him, according to the word of the Lord, which he spake unto him. It says, uh, uh, and he spake unto his son, sat, uh, saying, Saddle me the ass, and they saddled him. And he went and found his carcass cast away, and the ass and the lion standing by the carcass. The lion had not eaten the carcass, nor torn the ass. This, again, is just proof uh, that God was involved in this thing happening. The lion wasn't even hungry. He, he didn't eat the donkey. He didn't eat anything else, nor did he tear up the carcass and eat the carcass. He just left it there exactly how the Lord said that it would be. So here's what we've got. If we just looked at the text that we read, I know that we've read a lot of Bible tonight. Well, if we just looked at what we've read, here's what we've got is this problem, not only with the rulers of Israel, but also with the people of Israel of disobedience. Now, we talked a little bit about disobedience on Sunday morning, specifically tonight, the children of Israel in a manner of disobedience struggled with these false idols and these false gods these people or these beings or these things that they worshiped in the place of God that ultimately cost them everything, each one of these men, all the way down the line, as we've read tonight. For you and me, it's an example, right, and a testimony to us that we need to keep our mind, not only our mind, but our heart in the right place as we serve the Lord, amen, that we're not going to all these different things, but rather keeping the focus where it needs to be, which is on God. For whatever reason, and for whatever circumstance, each one of these men made a decision based on the things happening in life that resulted in them being in disobedience to God and then ultimately losing everything that they had in life because they didn't follow God. So here's what I know. Difficult situations will arise and things will happen in life that will demand attention and response and some of these different things. And if you're not careful, they will prompt you to go to or to travel after or to seek after different things that God never intended that we worship. In fact, if we go all the way back in the history of the children of Israel, do you remember what God's plan was for them as a king? Do you remember how it all started? They weren't even supposed to have a king. All the way back in the beginning, God said, I'm going to be your God. You're going to follow me and, and that's going to be enough. And they cried and they cried and they cried for a king. Right. We talked about Saul, their first king and all his mistakes. They weren't even supposed to have a king. God's plan was always that they would be content with following him, doing things his way, not needing another man to lead, not needing all these different things. But again, because of their disobedience over and over and over again, we see not only in the book of Kings, in the book of Chronicles, we see all over the place this issue of disobedience that the children of Israel had. Now, where did it stem from and where did it start? Well, here's what we can do. We could even go back past Solomon and we could trace this thing all the, back, all the way back. And here's what you've got. You've got this footprint of sin that literally follows all the way back to the first man that the promise was made that there'd be a nation out of him, which is Abraham. Abraham passed it down to his sons who passed it to their sons. You, you can trace the disobedience all the way through it's been traced all the way through that history of those children of Israel. The sins that they struggled with got magnified and, and, and became bigger and bigger and bigger with these generations that came to the point now. Abraham's problem, in, in one instance, was that he lied about his wife being his sister. That, that seems tiny to somebody making calves and worshiping them, right? And perverting the whole nation of Israel with worshiping. What happens? That sin was multiplied and magnified because of, again, the disobedience generation after generation after generation. And so for you and me tonight, we've got many examples, but one other thing that we can pull from this portion of scripture is this, that our sin and the things that we struggle with are so important to be dealt with, not only for us, but also for the people after us, amen? Those kids, those grandkids, those people that come after us, it's important that we have our heart right with God, not only for our household's sake, but for their households and the generations that are to come afterwards. This disobedience you can trace all the way back. These, these, these same issues that they had with cunningness and, and some of these lies and, and, and all these, you can trace them all the way back. And so for you and me, here's what we've got to know. We've got to know it's not just our lives that our sin affects, but also those that come literally after us 
that they're going to struggle with these things. The Bible puts it like this, that the sins of the father visit even the third and fourth generation. We know that those sins, again, are past, not meaning that those children are forced to do the same things that their fathers were done, but they're more prone to do those things. Uh, again, because it's been in that, that family's history, those sins are, are, are now past. We know that they're prone to those things. So here's what we've got to do. We've got to watch ourselves, not only for us, but also for the generations to come. Because now the children of Israel have this giant mess of disobedience that, that now they're all scattered. They're, there's all kinds of different things going wrong when the whole time God is simply asking, would you just look back up at me? Would you just put me back where I belong in your life? Would, would you just get rid of all the false gods and would you just look back to me? And would you just recognize me as king? That, that's what the Lord wanted all along. And for you and me, I feel like so many times that that's what the Lord is doing in our lives is simply asking and beckoning us just to realize who he is again. Watch this. And then to turn our vision back to him, not the things of the world. And, and I feel that sometimes the things in life literally become our gods, the, the jobs, the careers, the school, the family. Even nowadays, the family can be a God, all these different things if they're not kept in check, can become idols to us or little g gods that we're serving, how does that end? Well, we just saw it with four different men that were originally ordained by God, all disqualifying themselves because of this same problem, disobedience and other idols that they brought into life. And friends, so here's what we can conclude and here's what we can know about our journey and our walk and our lives tonight is this. God is the only person that belongs on that pedestal. He's the only one that, that deserves the preeminence. He's the only one that has the ability and the authority and, and, the, and, and the, uh, all the different things he has to, to lead us in the right directions rather than the world that we follow so often. So all these men struggle with this disobedience tonight recorded for us as an example and a testimony that we walk after the Lord. And one thing that we have that they never had is the word of God. And so we can literally follow the word of God, not, not just the verbal word of God like they had, but we have the written word of God that we can truly follow. And I'll tell you this, if you want a God in your life, make this book, amen? Place this book where it belongs in your life and let that be your God and let that be your guide. I'm telling you, friend, that's what God intended for us, not the things of the world that will never satisfy, but ultimately lead to destruction. And when those idols are given place, that's when Satan gets in and ruins lives and ruins families. And then, if you just look at this whole nation, ruins their testimony for a season. Now, praise the Lord. Amen. He brings them back time and time again. But ruins their testimony this time and this place because of who they're serving and what they're worshiping. Friend, there, there's signs and, and, and tales all over the Bible, again, of the same fashion, warning us to keep our minds and our hearts pure. Uh, it reminds me that constantly I have to refresh my mind, constantly. I have to go through this hard and, and get rid of all the junk. And Angie Peace came up to me before service and said, uh, do you mind if I go through that freezer in there and just throw away some of the things that are old? She says, there's things that are, are bricks of ice now and have freezer burnt and all kinds of hot dogs that are three, four years old. And You have to go through those things, otherwise they just stack up in there, right? They're not good, they're not doing anybody any good, they're just taking up space. We've got to do the same thing with our heart, clean it out, keep it clean, constantly take inventory of what's being taken in, what's being given out, what's existing there, that we know the condition and our walk with the Lord, that we're right with him, not wrong. Because when those idols are given place again, it can only lead to destruction. And so tonight we need to realize who God is, put him in his place, amen, like we've talked about so many times, and not walk in this pattern of disobedience that again we've seen all through these last three chapters of the book of kings and think about all the lives that were ruined or, or at least scarred because of again this disobedience in just one man's life uh, this wasn't all the people's fault this was the leader they had at the time again that caused them uh, to have all this suffering and, and these different things and so for us tonight it's an example one that we should hear not only hear but also do and implement and put in our lives again this guard that nothing else is going to take the place of god in our lives we're going to give god that place and so with every head bowed, every eye closed, you stand, we'll pray, and uh, we'll conclude our service. Lord, again, love you tonight, need you. We've looked through the book of Kings tonight, Lord, and, and just some of the struggles and issues the children of Israel had. And over and over, God, we see in Scripture that they struggled with these gods. They struggled with these idols. Lord, and it's so strange because of how many times you came through for them.
It's so strange because how many examples and times that you gave them, again, that they would see you and understand who you were, that yet they were still prone to leave you and still prone to walk after other things. And so, Lord, we know this. Even those people that literally walked with you and saw you move as a pillar of cloud and a fire, that they, they saw you. So much, so, uh, so much more so are we prone to walk after false idols and gods not having seen you in the flesh than somebody who had. And so, God, I, I pray that for this church and for us as individuals that you guard us, guard our, our minds and our hearts and guard our, our walk and our testimony. Lord, again, that we not be walking after idols or different things of this world, but rather walking to you. And God, I pray that this problem of disobedience would be one that would stop with us. And Lord, tonight I pray for your servants that we be obedient. Lord, looking for your word and following it. Looking to your word and implementing it in our lives. And God, doing all that we can, again, to take steps closer to you. And God, let that be our testimony rather than uh, disobedience and, and all these different issues that were presented and help us to follow you. So, Lord, we love you tonight. Again, need you so much. Pray that you work in our hearts, please. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With every head bowed and every eye closed tonight, maybe you need to come. And maybe disobedience, maybe idols, maybe false gods, whatever it is, uh, is something that you've struggled with. And maybe tonight you say, I need to get that thing right. I need to put God back where he belongs and, and, and start to worship him instead of these other gods. And, friend, if that's you tonight, would you just come? Would you make that your prayer tonight? Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. I, I don't know the testimony of every believer in this room tonight, but maybe you're not saved. You say, tonight's the night. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. I want to give up the disobedience. I want to give up the gods of this world. And I want to know Jesus Christ. Friend, whether you're watching online or whether you're with us in the sanctuary, here's what you can know tonight. That you can know Jesus simply by accepting him for who he is. And the difference, if you look at it in all these different men of God's life, you look at Josiah, the eight-year-old king that reigned, the difference was he followed Jesus. These men before him did not follow. You don't follow Jesus, friend. It ends in destruction. It ends in death. But friend, tonight, if you choose to follow Jesus, here's what I can guarantee you. It ends in eternal life. Amen. Uh, an eternal life that is guaranteed inheritance of heaven. And so, friend, if that's you tonight, and you need to come, make tonight the night as you be saved. Don't put it off for another day. You come tonight. You make Jesus your Savior. Whatever it is, whatever reason you have for coming, the altar's open. I'm going to bow and I'm going to pray. You come right now. The altar's open. What's so interesting to me is the last person that we talked about tonight, again, was the prophet, right? And if we had more time, we'd talk more about him. But for the sake of time tonight, what's interesting to me is that he was just used by God. He was just used by God to deliver the message. He was just used by God to heal that hand that was dried up. And, and, and watch this. And his guard was let down because God's hand was just on him. And then immediately afterwards now is in disobedience. And friend, I think that we need to beware, amen, whether we're actively doing the works of God or not, we need to beware of these things. Don't think that you're exempt from falling to these false idols. We get sometimes this high and holy roller attitude that nothing could throw me off. You've got to be careful, friend. At any moment, any one of us could be thrown off if we just would give Satan the opportunity. And so tonight we need to realize that man of God was just used. Where do we find him just verses later in disobedience, laying on the ground in front of a lion who just destroyed him? And, and that is a perfect picture of what Satan can do to us, again, if we just give him the opportunity. So don't think that you're above it. Don't think that you're exempt, but rather be prepared for those times and those places when they come and respond to them accordingly. Amen. So let's pray. We'll be dismissed tonight. Lord, we love you again. Need you so much. Pray that you be with us as we go. Work in our hearts through this week. And help us, Lord, to have a testimony that points to you. And God, help us to give you honor and glory in everything that we do. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be dismissed.